here sitting beside Kevin Valmanini, Jomi, Shazad Dawood um, for a conversation. There's a lot of resonances between their works, and for those of you who had a chance to see them, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what some of those resonances are, what some of those relationships are. So Cavabao's drawings are the 13 drawings that you can see in the other room, and we'll also be seeing them on the, the slide behind us as well. And Shazad's work, we're actually sitting within it. Um, so it includes these paintings on the wall, um, this cod net, and I know he'll speak about it in more detail. And normally what's playing behind us is a film, and that's episode five of his 10-part series, Leviathan. So I wanted to take a moment just to introduce both Shazad and Kavabao. Um, Shazad Dawood, I, I first actually got to know your work in Winnipeg, strangely enough, where you were working on a kind of pseudo Buster Keaton film uh, at Plugin ICA, and we kept on sort of like cr almost crossing paths, but never meeting in person. I saw this extraordinary exhibition, and what it was was um, first, it was as though I was seeing a perspective of the water from the beings that lived in the water. And for me, this was this kind of amazing thing to think about ideas of migration and animal health and, or sorry, animal welfare and mental health, all sort of interrelated at this moment of what they were calling um, the migrant and refugee crisis. So we live in a time when there's more human beings moving around the world, uh, most of it out of extreme desperation, uh, than any other point in our human history. And Shazad responded, he was, as far as I understand, you were originally commissioned to do a piece of writing. And then you never finished that piece of writing. It's kind of like a lot of my projects. Uh, they start as one thing and then I, I sort of magically morph them and disappoint people along the way as they become something else. Um. <laughs> and it kept growing and growing. And also, I think a, a really important characteristic about this work, Leviathan, is how it's been done in conversation with many different people, with marine biologists, with oceanographers, with um, political scientists, even neurologists and other kinds of specialists. And one of the things that we talked about early on that characterizes you know, your interest is to speak to people who are deeply passionate about their subjects, whatever the subject that might be. Um, and Shazad, I know, has been working as an artist for more than two decades. He's based in London, England. Um, and as part of our conversations, we introduced him to these drawings of Kevin Menemy. And these drawings had this, they, they were already in dialogue in all of these ways. Even this drawing that you did Kevin of, you know, the blank projector screen and the projection, this was a surprise to us because I'd seen many of your others and I hope you'll speak about that. Um, Kevabao was born in Brandon, Manitoba. Um, his mother actually was pregnant with him when she was sent down to Manitoba from the High Arctic to uh, get treatment for tuberculosis. So Kevabao was born there. And then when he was about eight years old, he moved to Cape Dorset. Um, and as you told us this morning when we you met, uh, you said that um, when you moved to Cape Dorset, you didn't speak. Uh, in Uktitu, actually, and so you, you relearned that language, both from your parents and also from the community. And then in 1988, you started working um, for West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative, first as a printmaker in the lithography studio, and then you worked uh, on Stone Cut. But that entire time, you've been um, making all of these extraordinary drawings hundreds if not thousands of drawings. Um, and we were lucky enough to work together with Will Huffman, who's sitting here to my left at West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative, and we're deeply thankful for your collaboration, for your help, um, also your financial support for this, and also for supporting Jumi to come down and visit with us and, um, and be a part of this conversation as well. And Jomi works for um, West Bath and Eskimo Cooperative, and you've worked there for a very long time. You're one of their longest standing employees, as far as I know. <laughs> and when I went up to visit uh, the studio, you were there, and you were, you were my guide. Yeah. Uh, so. 
thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so with that said, the way that we were going to begin was um, with Camogel uh, speaking about uh, his, life, his life and his work, and then Shazad uh, will also speak about his work, and then we'll have a conversation. So we'll begin with, uh, with Camogel with, uh, your, with your images. Uh, I was saying that uh, this drive represents the driving, but I got so much of driving uh, theory because there was no vehicles up there. So, <laughs> so uh, he just said that a long time ago that uh, when these uh, movie, movie projects and uh, projectors were first introduced to Cape North, that uh, there was no uh, theater or building to show. So movies, movies, so uh, he drew this to just to show that uh, in the past that before movie theaters were in Cape Dorset or any buildings that they used to use, they used to use, uh, they used to watch much movies outside the, outside, outside, uh, outside the temple or something like that. This wheel, this wheel is a business wheel, and uh, uh, the reason for the, uh, the boats, both on the behind, uh, this wheel, uh, uh, he was fighting uh, against with the whale the whale, whale hunters. So uh, this whale uh, left this boat shake because he was uh, killing other other whales also, so protecting other whales. Ma tak ko, ang may tama ko may. Das mga abimi ikayabos ng tama mga kasi yun 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 Get off their, uh, the, the, the rope off them, but the whale is swimming so fast, but they can hardly hold on to the uh, rope. And uh, and these women are having a hard time uh, trying to get the rope off the uh, uh, of the whales. Uh, they try to rescue the whales. Among which of the show, Matai, we talk for a moment with a definitely getting ready. Down here, a carnage to you, Dan Ivy, that one moment with a nipping degree, just a moment. Ivy. This is Ivy, uh, we call it Laura's Ivy in Inner Tickle, and this is our Ammonial Clams, uh, we call Ammonial uh, Clams in Ammonial. Whales, uh, walrus eat, uh, uh, their delicacy is the uh, clams underneath, and uh, this whale was feeding on clams while uh, uh, under the water, and uh, when it surfaced to the ice, he uh, didn't realize that these uh, clams were stuck on, on him. So uh, uh, so he, after, after his big fish, he went up uh, to the ice and uh, and uh, figured, found out that this, uh, Clams were stuck to him uh, as, as if they're sucking on his skin. Uh, then, 
This is a fish. Uh, the fish found a uh, a mountain underneath the uh, water, and uh, uh, the, the fish is trying it on while going inside the uh, a mountain and uh, wondering if it's going into the mountain and maybe popping out on the other end. So uh, it's trying on the mountain underneath the water along with the kelps. This is beluga whale. Uh, apparently, the woman was feeding all the belugas badly, so therefore her punishment was for beluga to take him down uh, into the ocean, and uh, so to show the secret show more respect to the whales. How about just creating this image, uh, not knowing what he was going to create? So there's not much story to it. He just said that uh, he drew it because he thought it was going to really come, come out good to, uh, I mean, he liked the uh, image, so he didn't. When he drew it, he did not. He didn't think about what he was doing, what he what what he was drawing. So he just it's just an image that, that came up to his head with no story background to it. Sometimes uh, this is a blue uh, bowhead whale uh, which is netted and the beluga, beluga whales are trying to help this uh, bowhead whale to take off the uh, uh, whale off the nets, uh, off the nets, a uh, whale Try to take the whale, uh, nets out of the whale as the whale caught caught in the net uh, some time ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, as we all know, uh, whether climate is changing and there's odd, uh, odd fish that is go normally up to the north. Uh, back, back then, uh, fish, these are constant transfer, transformation of fish uh, from uh, from the well, from the weather, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the weather. Yeah, they migrate from south to north. Yeah. This is just a decoy for uh, when you go out when you go out east hunting, you always need a decoy to get these coming in. So this is one of the decoys that he put for a while he was hunting geese. Again, this is kelp uh, uh, due to weather changing and uh, also the kelp are changing its color, so this kelp is changing its color from going into red. Uh, from green to red because of the weather changing. So, uh, so as the uh, cups are changing their colors. 
Ya pichini kuda nanti ngawali cah sama Uh, this is a uh, uh, we call as uh, small small people in innovative we call innovative um, uh, This one innovative has found uh, uh, wings of a bird, so uh, he's just picking up them um, as help since size and uh, and uh, uh, apparently his father had seen them in the past, so some people. Some some inner uh, do believe they exist up somewhere in the tundra. Then I've been up to now. We just want to stop the visual version of the world today. So many up to now, just now. This uh, whale uh, was hunted by hunters. Uh, apparently, uh, it got away. That's why it has rope around it, because it's a survival well that hunters lost, and uh, and uh, that's why it has a uh, rope around it, because it got away from the hunters. That's it. Step up. Step up. I think um, Shazad will, will introduce his work and then uh, we'll have a common conversation and then we'll open up for questions after. Yeah. Uh, Shazad, how do you say your name again? Shazad. Shazad. Shazad, I'm going to talk about a little bit. world that is potentially 20 to 50 years in the future. And it's a kind of world of uncertainty. It's a world that uh, takes place on the water, but uh, I think tries to show all of these increasingly complex relationships. But it's not one that's not, not it's also infused with myth, I would say, that what you're doing with Leviathan. And so it's something I noticed as well in Kevavau in your, your work, you're also showing us different worlds. You show us the world of the little people, but you also show us the world of the water. Uh, you show us, I think, many times these interrelationships between uh, people and animals, and it's not a kind of codependency, but oftentimes actually the animals are taking control. So I had an initial question for you about this drawing where the whale attacked the whale hunter, so it attacked the boat, and it's actually becoming the boat. Is this, um, was this a story that was just for the drawing, or was it a story that is a bigger story in uh, Cape Dorset about, about this, about this vicious whale? I uh, <laughs> These images that he drew in the past uh, are from coming from his uh, uh, imagination, plus uh, uh, he would like 
people to show, uh, he wants to see, he wants people to see that uh, there were uh, hunters and whales that uh, touched the people of north. And also, uh, uh, he was told uh, stories about whalers and uh, whalers being attacked or losing their boats or uh, by being attacked by whales or losing their boats because the whale was too big to hunt. So uh, those are all kinds of things that uh, he's trying to show. Uh, that uh, it's true and it's imaginative. Thank you, Pamela. Um, Shazad, I wondered if you come across similar stories when you were doing your research, because I know that it seems like the sea, almost more than the land, is a place of story and storytelling, and, and especially stories about whales. I'm just trying to think where to begin, because there's about a hundred, hundred ways to answer that question. Um, what, I think what becomes a really interesting way to shift our prism on it, uh, there's a really beautiful line in James Lovelock's new book, Novacy, where he says, he just says what a misnomer Earth is, because this is actually an ocean planet. You know, it's, it's nonsensical, our, our, our prism. And, you know, and then if you think, I mean, I've been asked a few times why I call the project Leviathan when there's so many other works of, film, fiction, etc., called Leviathan, and I said that's exactly why I want to be one voice amongst many. And it's, it's how we kind of go about reframing these things to maybe, almost, it's not, it's not reinventing something, it's, or inventing something, it's just refreshing maybe some of our foundation myths. As, I mean, in episode which before the, the first ever exhibition of Leviathan in Venice, 2017, that Candice mentioned earlier, uh, one of my key research partners was, was the Institute of Marine Research in Venice, and one of their marine biologists, they were, they were very generous and many of their scientists agreed to meet me, but one of their marine biologists was very, um, I'm almost not sure what the right adjective is, but he was very skittish about meeting, he wanted to meet me, but in secret and very, in some, you know, and it just seemed, it was this sort of bizarre, almost like some sort of political cloak and dagger kind of activity we were getting up to. And in this little kind of out of the way bar in Venice, he sort of took me aside and, and, and began his confessional. And he, he was working um, on alien and invasive species. And so he was, he had an essential contradiction that he couldn't resolve, which is that he was, he was a sympathetic progressive to refugees and migrants and wanted to help them but he somehow found that in conflict with his day job, which was to stop non-human species getting into the West. Um, and, you know, I, I won't, you know, it was, it, was a, it was this, in that way, when you're talking to somebody who's particularly kind of nervous or awkward, it was a very long conversation, so I won't, I'll just still, don't worry. Um, but I, I sort of said, well, what species are we, are we talking about? And obviously, the focus of his life's work is crayfish, and, you know, after the whole build-up, I remember laughing because it was slightly kind of comical that, you know, this whole sort of cloak and dagger activity was, was about crayfish. And, um, and, you know, jokingly I said, well, are they Islamic crayfish because they're coming in from the east and polluting the western Mediterranean, um, you know. And, you know, he said, actually, no, they're Louisiana red swamp crayfish. And I was like, Wow, okay, that, that shifts the paradigm yet again. And, you know, these, uh, the Louisiana red swamp crayfish is, turns out to be one of the most invasive species in the water. They're even in the Tiergarten in Berlin. Uh, they can survive in fresh water, salt water. Um, and what's interesting was initially kind of going, you know, because obviously that first, the first reaction was a comical one of what's the big deal about a few crayfish? And obviously it turns out that the uh, Louisiana crayfish feeds on heavier metals. It's uh, it's not fit for human consumption, but it's still uh, eradicating the native European crayfish and having a, a, a huge uh, impact on coastal fishermen. And then, and then, literally, he drew me a map of how this was sort of percolating out through society from the coasts in Italy inwards. And you know, this this should I, should I quickly round up about the waving crayfish? Yes. Okay, so. We, we, got, we got a number of these scientists to do talks in Venice uh, who'd had a really big impact on me and my thinking. And 
um, and Tiziano is his name, and you know, we were trying to coach scientists to not do a PowerPoint and to do something a bit more engaging and a bit more playful. And uh, he became the star of the biennial uh, because he turned up with this bigger than life-size fiberglass Louisiana crayfish and being very nervous and skittish and not knowing what to do without a presentation, he crazily told this story while waving this <laughs> fiberglass crayfish around like, like a lunatic. And he became the darling of the media and the crayfish was actually, became the whole icon for, uh, for the Leviathan Project in Venice. Ken, does you have anything to ask? I think it's going to take us a half an hour. <laughs> Halo Morgan, apa kau baca tu? Cita tu apa ini lagi? Siapa yang masih berjaya dengan tu? Apa lagi? Kau yang ada kerja semua kau dalam asing ini tu. Emang masih mula nak sibuk sana kau. Siapa orang kau yang nama tu? Emang dia tu lagi kau tu. Emang dia lebih cumi. Emang dia tu dia bawa hebat dia orang tu semua cumi. Emang dia tu lagi ini. Kau yang sokong orang tu semua. Tapi kau yang masih kau yang tu. Tahu orang tu orang tu tak kau yang tu. Lepas itu kami mula tanya crayfish ni, cuma cuma ni to make it short. Ia tu, ia tu sesuatu yang kita nak tu mungkin mungkin kita orang kita asal ni dah semua. Saya masih masih mungkin crayfish ni kami orang kita asal ni. Tapi kalau lepas itu mungkin kita orang kami ada kerja macam ni, ada kerja macam ni, tapi nak elah kami orang kita asal ni mungkin crayfish pun ada semua. Ano, tawo kung kaya ni Paul ng mayo, tawo kung tawo bisa ha, upaga si bisa mo niya pa ni ngam ba? Kaya niya kayo, so kaya ba kaya nga imam niya kada kaya nga Paul. Sorry, Jimmy, well done. That's a story. Shazad, I know that when you saw Kavakal's work, you also thought that there were these interesting relationships. Now that you've heard Kavakal speak about them more, I wondered if you had some specific questions or, or any kind of interrelationships you wanted to bring out. I mean, the... Kavakal, Tana Suja, Tidak Tiwak Sumajagi, Maral Kanaya Sumajagi, Tako, Shana Sumajagi, Ano, apa kalau siapa yang begit, atau ada orang yang macam ni begit, atau, ano, kait ni kalau begit, dia tak semua ni, tapi macam mana? Tapi macam mana? Apa kalau siapa? Asyik mahu apa kalau siapa yang begit? Kalau siapa? 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 When did you start making these arts? When did you start your art career? I, I always think that's a difficult thing to answer because um, I think I knew, I knew I wanted to be an artist at seven and it was that sort of age when I think my parents thought I would grow out of it. Uh, you know, it's like at seven when you want to be an astronaut or a, or a fireman. And, um, but I was pretty, one, you know, pretty one track about it. There was never any doubt in my mind when I was about seven years old, so, I mean, it's an active career, maybe 20 years or more. Okay, we are going to say that the Pemanganak, I go on it, she will make the ceremony. Take us to what they are, 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 Hati kerja pun mesti, pelik juga pun mesti, tapi mesti pun mesti nak hidup kuat. Tanya ni, kita mesti cakap dia pun nanti. Asal tu, kita tu waktu yang baru. Kita ni mana kita tu waktu ni, kita mesti ngah orang cakap kita mesti ngah orang kata kita mesti ngah orang. I was interested about the use of nets in your work and whether there was any sort of deeper sort of mythic symbols in the nets. Oi. 
Don't worry, I will. Uh, I, I was interested in uh, Quavaro's use of nets and whether. Um, uh, nets, um, uh, in early years, there's used to be uh, marine uh, uh, where uh, nets are around up there. And nets are being used more often to cast whales, beluga whales, and whatnot. Uh, uh, nets are being used to hunt other uh, other main sea mammals. So see. See, please. So uh, each time uh, uh, fishermen or hunters lose their nets, they are, I always seem they'd be caught in a whale. So that's why he always drew, uh, drew, drew, drew uh, whales caught in the net because uh, it's be beginning to be more trouble, uh, more, more often than ever. So uh, that's the meaning of this draw. This draw is that uh, too many nets out there in the ocean uh, that are uh, loose that were. Uh, that were uh, uh, lost by hunters, and we know for sure they're out in the ocean. Pretty soon, uh, whales, uh, bowhead whales, will be caught in those whales. So that's why he's just saying that there's too many nets out there, too many fishermen uh, not, uh, losing their nets. So uh, he, he drew these pictures because he knows for a fact that uh, they, they're not only down under the water, but they're being caught by whales also. Maybe another quick one. What does uh, Kwabavas, from, from his work and from his thinking, think about the relationship between man and marine mammals? Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to an uh, answer that. Uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have an answer, but uh, uh, it's kind of hard to describe it, but uh, he, he, he doesn't know how to describe what your question is and what what answer would be good for your question, so he just he doesn't have that answer. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was uh, wondering your drawings cover the it's about how um, the woman who was treating the beluga badly and so she needed to show more respect to the whales and oftentimes your drawings it's this kind of almost like uh, correcting human bad behavior, bad behavior of humans. Uh, so I wondered if this was a, a story that you knew or, or just some, is a, is a bigger story or something just for the drawing? Uh, he's saying that uh, uh, it's my thoughts uh, that uh, that create these uh, images. Uh, just to care about what he's going to draw. So uh, sometimes uh, these images come in his thoughts. So uh, right away when he comes to his thoughts, he starts drawing these uh, images. So uh, it's just thinking that this, these things are happening. You also talked about kind of about these um, strange fish that are coming up uh, when we saw the image of the eels and the arctic char all related. Uh, are you seeing more of these uh, fish and the changes because the weather is getting warmer? <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Yes, uh, we are seeing more uh, different types of uh, marine animals uh, due to the fact of uh, due to uh, changing of the weather climate the, uh, because the weather is getting warmer. Uh, seems like the uh, the water is getting warmer also. So uh, southern marines are uh, going up north. They're swimming up to north more than ever. So uh, yes, we are seeing more different kind of uh, fish up there. And this relates to something that I realized in your work, Shazad, that, um, you know, at first you think that the bigger question is the, the migration of people, but actually what you realize is it's a much larger mi migration. It's a migration of all species, right, that's moving right now. Uh, is this something that you're going to take up more in the, in the future films? It's definitely something I've been thinking of increasingly, how, you know, there's not just a human uh, refugee crisis going on at the moment. I mean, there's, you know, a, a huge marine refugee crisis. Actually, it hasn't been termed that as yet, but I'm, and it's something I guess I, I've sort of spoken to maybe more abstractly before. But it's definitely something I want to kind of build towards in, in terms of this kind of pushing further this equivalence between us and other species that actually. Because, you know, it's funny, when I started out on this project, a lot of people didn't get the connection between um, ref refugees, migration, and climate. And obviously that's better understood now, but it's still within a very human dimension. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of pushback against what would be a sort of more natural, empathic relationship even amongst the human. So it feels like, actually, it, how long will it take to actually resolve that dilemma and expand the, the field of view, which, which is already something we've, you know, we've 